Welcome to Real Herbalism Radio, show 162, recorded at River Road Studios in Eugene, Oregon. Today's show is sponsored by Occupy Medical. Occupy Medical is a free integrated health clinic in Springfield, Oregon at 1717 Centennial. We believe that healthcare is a human right. You can reach us at occupy-medical.org. Hunter Creation, graphic designers and website designers bringing your marketing ideas to reality from retractable, retractable banners to business cards to websites that can help you get your idea out there and make sales for your company. Contact them at huntercreation.com and get healthy now with Candace. Get healthy now with Candace, connecting people with plants to transform lives. Candace is accepting new clients, and you can make your um, appointment through her website at gethealthynowwithcandace.com. Ace High Heat Graphics, custom printed um, clothing with your logo or slogan or any other little magical thing you want to put on there to uh, promote your business and or your group or to fundraise. If you're looking for a great way to raise money or to get your um, – concept or idea out there, uh, putting them on a shirt's a great way to do it. Contact them at acehighheatgraphics.com and to Sierra Lupe Consulting. Sierra Lupe Herbal Consulting is my herbal consulting business and I specialize in chronic um, disease management and I do work with people that have existing diagnosis and uh, they I can work with practitioners as well. You can reach me at at this great email. Sierra Lupe Herbal Consulting at gmail.com. Yes, that is exactly where you can reach me. And it, and you'll be talking to, to uh, Sue Sierra Lupe right here at forgetful.org. <laughs> <laughs> and the Herbal Nerd Society. And the, the, Yes, the Herbal Nerd <laughs> Society is the um, club that we have on our website that we use to fund the podcast and the website that we have. Uh, every month we go through a different herb and we put out an article every week about it on some aspect of it, whether that be energetics or part of its uh, biochemistry or uh, identification or I can't even remember the other things. Oh, using it in Western formulas. Uh, this is uh, just four ninety nine a month or you can pay for the entire year and have a nice little savings and that will only be uh forty nine ninety nine a month, right? No, per year. Per, per year. year. Yeah, yeah forty nine ninety nine per year. Yeah. Right. Year. So you basically get two months for free if you sign up for a That's year. Right. That's right. That's a hot deal. That's, That's a hot, hot deal. smoking deal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. As you know, Black Friday and Cyber Monday are right around the corners. That means a lot of people are gonna be looking at their Kindles. Um make sure to fill your Kindles with the practical herbalist press um herbal folios and the pocket herbal and the Herbalism for the Zombie Apocalypse, all books that have been written by both Candace and Sue, respectively. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really great way to, to um, share in uh, herbalism and the practical herbalist and uh, support us. So another thing is if you happen to be on our website and see a link to Amazon to buy one of the books that we recommend, we'd love you to use that as your gateway into your Christmas shopping. So start there, and if you decide to buy the book, cool. And if you don't, you decide to buy a big screen TV afterwards, that's fine too. We mm -hmm. get a real referral for that, and that yep. makes it easy for us. It doesn't cost you anything extra to do so. so. And please also leave a review for our podcast, for our um, the on our Facebook page, on the podcast itself, because that helps people find us. So we appreciate that. Absolutely. Anywhere where you get your podcast, and um, whether that's Stitcher or iTunes, leave a review. I know it takes a little extra time, but it does help us get the word out and nothing says it better than to have a testimonial from somebody else. Mm -hmm. So with all that good stuff, I guess it's time for the show. Anyone who's been down to the pub lately can testify to the amazing renaissance of flavors now available on the beer scene. We herbalists have been quite pleased to note the variety of bittering herbs and wonderful herby flavors we're finding among home brews and microbrews. We particularly love how brewers are reaching into their local plant communities for inspiration. Today we're talking with Christina Sanchez, founder of Every Leaf Speaks, about her experience working with up-and-coming pros to brew amazing beers with desert herbs. Now here are your hosts, Candace Hunter and Sue Sierra Lupe. I'm Candace Hunter. And I'm Sue Sierra Lupe. And, and welcome, welcome to, to Real Herbalism, Herbalism Radio. Radio. 
Hey, Christina. Welcome back. Hi. Yeah, it's good to have you back again. Nice to see In the y'all. flesh. I know. In this the is flesh. awesome. Can't believe yeah. I'm here. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It's so exciting. To new listeners, we've had Christina Sanchez uh, as an interview host or interview guest before. However, this was over Skype. So now we have her right here in the studio. Mm-hmm. It's really nice. All the way from Joshua Tree. Joshua Tree. Yay. Yeah. The desert. The desert. Yeah. yeah. Wildly different climate, eh? Mm-hmm. I'm really getting, this is a shock. Yeah. <laughs> My skin is reacting. Uh-huh. You um, walked into a moldy sponge. Yeah, I, yeah definitely state. a lot of mold. Yep. yep. But a lot of nice plants here. <laughs> Lots world. of pollen. Yeah. Yeah, I'm feeling this the pollen. happens to be a very high pollen day. Yep. Mm-hmm. So what's it like where you're from right now? Right now, well, it's um, we're approaching summer and we still have some of the spring blooms. We didn't because of the lack of rain. We don't we didn't have such a big bloom this year, hmm. so it's not as colorful. So it's still very dry and um, starting to be getting really warm. It's actually cooled up as I left, but it's been in the nineties and uh, we don't have the humidity like it is up here. It's not as moist. Uh, so it's a desert that is very dry. And so my skin, now that I'm here, is mm-hmm. just kind of reacting to this area. And plus, now that you said how the pollen count is high right now, and that's a side effect that I just have, you know, I'm tired. I can't, I don't, I'm so sluggish while I'm here. So um, I don't like that. But <laughs> it's definitely different. You know, I'm coming from a really dry climate to where there's a lot of moisture in the air. And I'm, my body, I'm not drinking as much water as I normally do. I could feel hydrated, even though I'm not really yeah. drinking mm-hmm. enough water. You can see why yeah. people drink a lot of coffee up here, why it's a big deal. Mm-hmm. I've been wanting so a lot of, bleh. yeah, I've been craving yeah. a lot of coffee. Yeah. Yep. A yeah. lot of coffee. Kind of yeah. takes that lethargy away, and then it also helps pull some of that crud out of your lungs a little bit. It fires so, you up. Yeah. Yep. It's a little stringent, so it, it gets this, that nasty stuff out of your throat, too. Yeah, I've been yeah. feeling, I've definitely been feeling a lot more. I'm glad you said that, Candace, because I've yeah. been so tired. And, oh, yeah. And I, I don't know what's wrong with me. No, that's pollen. Know. Yeah, Welcome and I know, not, I know it's not, you know, jet lag. <laughs> Welcome not, to the Pacific right? Northwest. Yeah, this is, yeah, I haven't been here in many years. So. This is the place mm-hmm. to kick back and have a homebrew. Oh, yeah. Yes, it, totally it is. is. Yeah. It totally is. And you've been brewing with folks recently. Yes, I uh, was connected up with the Joshua Tree Brewery Company, and mm-hmm. these gentlemen, it's Gemma and Dario, uh, they are the founders of it, but it's going to be a co-op brewery. So there's different brewers that are going to be involved in this project. But I've been brewing with these two gentlemen in specific because they asked me to come in and they wanted to make a beer that was based around the desert herbs. That's Mm -hmm. exciting. So I've been able to, I'm not a beer person. So this is, is like different to me, you know, I don't, I so, know I like IPAs, but you know, yeah, um, they're relying on your experience as an herbalist as, to yeah. bring in the bittering herbs and the different flavors. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's awesome. So I've been helping these gentlemen. We've just did our second batch, which we're going to try today. Live. I'm excited. I can so, hardly wait. Um, Very nice. Yeah. So that's my new project that I've been working on. So what kinds of herbs have you guys been working with? So the first batch of beer, uh, we did white sage that was uh, gathered from my girlfriend's garden. And then we did as the, um, what is it? It's the flavoring we wanted, like pinion, pinion pine. Mm -hmm. So we did uh, pinion, white sage. And at that time for the aroma, um, somebody who's not part of this project uh, suggested that we add in chia. Because when chia is chia dry, seed? chia, no, the flower, oh. if you crush it up, I wish I brought some with me. If you crush it up, it has this really sweet, distinct aroma. Ooh. So the person that was like, the the person that was like chipping in this, you know, thought it might be a good idea. And uh-huh. so we've since taken it out and we've replaced it um, with pin. Actually, no, the first batch was white sage, yerba santa, and chia. Okay. So that was the first nice. batch of beer that we made. And now that we just did our second, now it's um, white sage, yerba santa, and pinion pine. Okay. And we have pinion as the aroma. Are you using the resin or the leaves? No, we're using the needles. The needles. The needles, yeah. yeah. Makes I, sense. I thought about doing the resin, but I just don't know how. I think how the it... resin would be tough. Yeah. I mean, you're boiling it, so you could pull it out, but I think it would be tough to get really get, yeah, don't you think? Yeah, the water. Yeah, yeah the waters and resins are yeah, really, you know, really difficult. You'd have to get to a really high, high temperature, and that might yeah. be difficult. Yeah, that would be too itself. much for the. That would be too much for the malt. Mm-hmm. That wouldn't be good for that. So. Wow, that's incredible. 
I'm really looking forward to this. <laughs> so, did he, so did you like what with the chia flowers? I've never thought about using those. What was it? How did they turn out? I mean, it wasn't noticeable. Okay. You know, mm. we couldn't notice the person that suggested this was not an herbalist. He right. was a friend of those folks and he just thought that maybe it that would could be go an interesting good, scent. but yeah. I just felt that it was not also sustainable because you would have to use a lot of yes. plant material. You yeah. would need a lot for that. You need a lot. So it didn't make yeah. sense to do that. And with pinion, you don't need that don't much. Need yeah, it's very it's strong. Totally, it's right, very yeah. strong. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we wanted to formulate a beer that was based around the smell of a desert. Yeah. You yeah. know, and, and there's different parts of the Mojave uh, Desert where I, I'm from, where mm -hmm. Joshua Tree is at, that you can get, you know, you get to the juniper woodlands, the pinion yeah. woodlands, and so you have that aroma, that smell, yeah. and then you get to, um, you know, we wanted something that was just, I mean, there's not a lot of white sage growing. As no, we know. yeah, and that's actually what I was gonna say. You don't want to get wild harvested white, white no. sage because it's it's endangered. Yeah, it's it's on the two watch species list. So yeah. we're definitely. I was very. In fact, I got the guys, um, the brewers, to plant a garden. I took them down to Cactus oh, Mart. There's this great nursery yeah. that focuses on uh, drought tolerant plants and plants wow. that are also in danger. Our two watch. Yeah. Um, so they grow, they have it, and I took these guys out there so they can purchase it and, and encourage them. If we're going to be doing this beer, it's more sustainable to the plant. Yeah. To, and plus, I don't want to always go to my girlfriend's. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> gathering from her um, and to, you know, just to grow your own. I yeah. am not home. I'm always traveling. I'm always on the go. So it's hard for me to grow. Right. You know, yes. and, yeah. and do this yeah. myself. So I, I encouraged them and they started doing it and now nice. they're growing. Nice. Um, Oshala Farms, though, I found out, has a lot of, ah, good. Yeah, she good. grows her own. So that was another, you know, option. But we want to keep it to the desert as much right. as we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've used a lot of culinary sage in brewing in the past. And it's different. I think white sage would have a really distinctively a different, I mean, it's going to have that common sageness, mm -hmm. you know, but I mean, even the smell of white sage is different. It's totally different. Yeah. It's totally different. Should we open yeah. it up? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. can I ask you, Osco, sure. did they find out about your herbal training through your Every Leaf Speaks company? Well, I was dating somebody <laughs> <laughs> and he would talk a lot about me that, you know, I was an herbalist yeah. in the desert and, mm -hmm. and he would tell them, you know, he liked me. So he yeah. was talking yeah. nice about me. Well, he's clearly got good taste. Well, yes, exactly. We <laughs> like you too. So yeah. there's some consensus <laughs> yes. right there. Yeah. So yeah, he, he did talk me up and then, uh, one of the brewers, Dario, befriended me on Facebook, and he was nice. seeing what I post, and he mm -hmm. saw that I wildcraft, and I talk about being ethical, and right. um, that I was teaching classes as well. So he wanted to reach out, and, and when he asked me to collaborate on a project, I was just, I was like, I don't know anything about brewing beer, you know? Like, I barely even know what beers are. Right. So he's he's really so, helped yeah. me, and I've helped from what he calls womb to the tomb. Right. You know, the beginning to the end. So mm -hmm. I've I've seen the whole process. I've nice. done the grinding. I've I've seen yeah. it all happen. So it's I really appreciate beer now. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. nice. Yeah. yeah, I noticed you brought some malts with you. Yes, these are the pale malts because we wanted to have. Um, we wanted to, this is a pale ale that we're going to be drinking actually. Right. And we wanted to have a blank canvas to feature the herbs. American. So taste, yeah. We I brought some for you to sample. Okay. Go ahead and grab. So I I opened up here the American two row. Um, mm. I American like it. two row pale malt. So that's one of the base herbs that they are herbs malts that they would be using in the, as they're creating the wort. Yep, it's crunchy and sweet. Mm -hmm. It's delicious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's delicious. I used yeah. to drink malts when I was a kid. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we um, did mm, that. Really good. And then the other one that you brought is an American pale malt. Mm -hmm. So we're going to give that a try now. Give that too. a try, yeah. yeah. Mm. They're, they're delicious. So you, you guys start with this and you grind it up. We grind it up and uh, we break the grains down. Mm -hmm. This is all like, I'm telling mm -hmm. you, this is all like new to me. Uh -huh. It's like. I feel like I'm just learning. Well, I am just learning. But anyway, so we break it down and then um, hmm. the steps is like, then yeah. the, the sparge is created. Like I'm learning all of this stuff that's so new to me. You yeah. Know? 
So if they're teaching me something and I'm teaching them about the herbs and how we can blend, you know, herbs mm-hmm. with, you know, the grains, yeah. the moss that they're doing um, to create this. And it's, mm. it's interesting. So the bigoting part usually a earthier tasting. Yeah. The American mm-hmm. pale malt, the non two row is a little bit earthier and a little less sweet. Um, when you put those in, you grind them up and then you like, you need to convert the starches, starches into carbohydrates, starches into sugars. Into sugars yeah. yeah. My science mind, you know, <clears throat> then you, you go, do what yeah. they call the sparge. Yeah. Right? So the That's... sparge is essentially taking the liquid, all the liquid off, which carries with it all the sugars and flavors. Yeah. You do what they, uh, he basically told me, it's like, you give it a shower. Yeah, we're restraining the sugars, and that's done at um, what 170 degrees. Mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, and so then they do like a 14. Well, for this batch, it's 10 gallons that we did. Nice. And so we're doing everything small uh, batches mm-hmm. for the, the time being because this is all experimental. So we're sharing this with our friends. We're taking it yeah. to events. Um, and it's been, uh, they took it to a woman's conference in, I think it was Cathedral City, or maybe it was Palm Springs. Anyway, they took it to this event and women had, um, a really good response. Women who don't like beer had a really good response mm. to this. And I don't want to focus on this as like, no, it's not a woman's beer. Like mm. it, it could be any person's beer who likes herbs, you know, mm-hmm. I, that's what I'm, I want to focus on is it can be for anybody. I don't want it to just be for women, but women especially my girlfriends that are not beer drinkers love this beer nice and me i'm not a beer i'm not a big beer fan so this i'm and it's not i'm like i've helped do it so i right. you know it's different for me I'm, well yeah and when you've helped a create functional. a beer it's like your children it's you like always my baby. love your own children you may not like other people's but you know, yeah so it's, it's, it's how definitely can you not my like creation. your own beer right yeah it's interesting so yeah give it a okay, let's give let's it a pop get, let's open it open up, up. go all righty i'm gonna pass it over and let one okay. of you guys pour, it. pour so as i don't make a mess yeah i learned how to pour beer too because i was doing it where i was giving it a lot of head and yeah you have to pour down the side yeah it's funny because when i visited um so when i was in prague there was uh i went to the original oh what is it called pilsner or qual oh yeah so it was like one of the oldest uh, bar restaurants in town. So I went there and I was so curious as to why everybody's Stein had so much foam because in America, that's bad. That's negative. Right. Yes. So the way I would pour beer was just really heavy and sloppy. And so the guys taught me like how you properly pour it with not right. a lot of head because yes. you don't want that. So mm-hmm. um, that's yes. something that I've learned. So I'm glad I poured your glasses. Yeah, I was going to say, I want to ask any of you European listeners out there, if you want to like let us know i've always been curious about that because my yeah. grandmother who grew up in poland uh, but moved back to america when she she like spent 19 years in poland and when she moved back to america it was a like when i knew her so this was many years after she was in america having a big head on your beer was really important she'd lots always like brag lots of foam know. big head that was a big deal and was a really like that was a good beer. That was a good so beer, So yes. I'm curious if that might be a difference between American style and European style. Mm. Uh, so yeah. if any of y'all are out there in Europe or know European culture well, you know, feel free to shoot me a, like, shoot, put a comment on our thing yeah. or something and let us know because I'm yeah. curious. I'm, I'm definitely curious too because I think it's yeah. weird. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. We're going to give this a try. Cheers. Eyes. Everybody, eyes. 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 Cheers. Now, a word from Thomas Easley about the Journal of Functional Herbalism. The Journal of Functional Herbalism is a free online journal promoting the integration of traditional Western herbalism, clinical nutrition, and functional medicine. It's published by the Eclectic School of Herbal Medicine, and you can find the Journal of Functional Herbalism at functionalherbalism.com. Mm, you can, in the background, that you may hear nice. the sound of people swallowing. I like that. Sipping. I like that. Yeah, I can taste it after it's been sitting in your mouth a bit, then you get definitely get that pine taste. Mm-hmm. And the last one is the sage. I like that. Mm. It's got layers. Like an onion. Yes. Or a Patrick. Ogre. <laughs> Patrick's the beer lover. <laughs> yeah. Well, um it's balanced. It's fruitier, sweeter than I would normally like. Okay. But there's a nice effervescent there. I could see this on a hot day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what's the resin taste? 
at the very last of it. it would that be the Yerba Santa? You it think? could be the Yerba Santa um, because that sat in. We put that in at the, was, you put something in at the 60, at the 15. So that one was sitting in the 15 and then okay. Kenyon was the last. Mm-hmm. So yeah. the last one is the, is the aroma hops. Is the aroma. That's yeah. what you smell. But yeah. I also think that because of the resin, I mean, with the pinion, because it some of the be needles may have had some of the, you know, mm-hmm. resin in there, it could have possibly. And what did you put in the first? Um, first was the white sage. The white sage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we did your basanta. It, but this beer changes. That's what's really it interesting. It's going uh-huh. yeah. It, yeah. It goes through. You taste the sage. I taste the sage the whole thing. What's even going to change and, in the bottle? Yeah, mm-hmm. and then I taste yeah. the pinion, and Over then the that I know your basant tastes like, smells like. I seen it, mm-hmm. and I tasted that at the very end, but it took me a minute. What is what's that? Because there's still the sage is on top of it. The sage, yeah, it's definitely on there. I didn't want it to be too overpowering because that's um, some folks don't like the taste of white sage, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. I wanted to balance it out. And something that I found really interesting about your basanta is the more I've read about your basanta is that that has been used in um, with cooking and in, in Mexican cultures. Um, I don't remember my mom ever ever working with your basanta, but um, I read that that's how Mexicans would flavor their bitter chocolates. Oh, oh, that would be so yeah. good. Oh. So you know what? I feel really bad because I made a decoction today um, using the basanta was in there. In the uh-huh. pinion chai for the cake, I oh. replaced water for this chai that I make. Mm-hmm. And I had, oh man, I wish oh. I would have bought it. But I've been using the basanta in my cooking and yeah. making chais. Uh, because it's really sweet. So if I don't want to use too much licorice in something, I'll add yeah. yerba santa. Mm. Makes sense. So yeah. I found that you can do a lot. That's what made me want to do yerba santa because of the sweetness, because I wanted to numb, like dole out the bitter effects of the hops. Makes sense. Yeah. I didn't yeah. like, the, I don't really like hoppy beers. That's mm-hmm. what I'm learning. Yeah. I don't, I don't personally like hoppy beers as much either. They're more depressing. <laughs> <laughs> hops is kind of a like mild sedative, right? sedative Mm -hmm. depressant yeah so you know it's not something that i really like to increase Mm -hmm. i'd rather have something a little peppier right it makes you makes you really what it makes you really uh tired for a lot of people tired and there are people that react poorly to it yes so topical they'll get these big rashes on them and different things like that so So. your basanta is used medicinally how Oh, yerba santa has been used, uh, especially for the lungs. And yeah. that's what I work a lot with yerba santa for is because coughs and colds and flus, um, allergies, hay fever. It's gently moistening. It's correct. definitely moistening. And what I've noticed is it's also astringent. Nice. So oh, yeah, it is. I've yeah. I've used it when I've had bronchitis, like last spring. I've, mm-hmm. I've experimented with a lot of different herbs. And I found yerba santa is, I just love the way it tastes, yeah. you know. And so I drink a lot of it mm-hmm. and it takes a little bit you like i brought you I the, the yep it takes a I little made bit that into yeah. t-shirt and was you know i had to kind of taste it along the way how you doing y'all it's okay in there and woo, yeah. it's strong it socks off. it's oh. definitely strong yeah but it was uh, like a good point stuff. where i used like three leaves and a cup of tea when <laughs> i was sick and i <laughs> was, was like two leaves too many yeah that was two leaves too many yep <laughs> yeah i've I definitely been learning strong. but i've also learned that because of how strong it is, it will overpower any type of taste you don't want to have. Yeah. So I, like I said, I like to sweeten things with it. I've even put, I've experimented, like I've been learning how to make soup. Oh, Cause you would fun. think I wouldn't know how to make soup, but I'm learning. <laughs> soup, is actually, <laughs> soup isn't easy. It's an art form. It's an art form. It's like knowing what goes together. And sometimes I, well, I'm experimenting now with the, those pressure cookers Oh, yeah, sometimes the, it's great. Was like the Instapot? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the multi-cookers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't have yeah. the Instapot. I have a different one that my mother gifted me, but I want the Instapot. That yeah. one, the seven-in-one, right. the yogurt yeah. setting, that's the one yeah. I want. But mm-hmm. I've been experimenting with the Instapot, but I've been uh, – sometimes I create a soup, and it's gross. Right. It just overcooks it. Yeah. So everything's mush at the end of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Yerba Santa um, – yeah, whatever I don't like, if I, if it's too uh, strong of a taste, it I notice that it will a little okay. bit goes a long way and it will yeah. really change the flavor. And so the thing I notice about this beer is that the longer that it stays open, um, the longer it breathes, mm. it just it changes, changes even in your cup. 
Nice. How long has this been in the bottle at this point? This one we bottled uh, a week ago on Monday. So, it, so it's a on? very young beer week. then. How mm-hmm. long did you condition it? Or how long? Because there's primary fermentation and then there's often called secondary or just conditioning. So, so the primary fermentation usually takes about a week, week and a half, depending on your yeast. Yeah, this one we did for 10 days. Okay. So we did it for 10 days. And then... um. We force, that's what I'm learning how to force mm-hmm. carb. Yep. So I did that uh, with them on Monday nice. and we bottled it. Okay. So, so it's a very young beer. It's a very young beer. And I, I actually liked the, it's weird because it's the same batch, but the right. bottles before this, you know, the last right. bottles that the we youngest. got bottled, whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, that tasted a little bit different than this yeah. batch does. Yeah. Mm. And it'll probably, so, I think this will be really interesting to see what it's like in about six months because uh-huh. mm. it's going to continue to change throughout the next develop. Well, you can't stick around. Like we don't let, I don't know. Yeah. Whenever my friends come around like or I'm months. gifting these out to people. Right. So everybody is opening them sooner. I'm going to reserve one just for myself to see how yes. it'll taste and yeah, I'd you know. be I'd be mm-hmm. interested. You want to give me an update then, like yeah. about six months from now. We'll put that in the bottom of the show notes. Right. By then, Let it might know. even have a name. Right? Yeah, we don't have a name yet. The, the guys have left it up to me to name the beer, and um, I just can't, I don't know, what I keep flip-flopping. Remember, I was asking right. you, like, what do you think I should name this? I don't know. So we still don't have a name. I guess I'm in no rush because we're still waiting for the brewery to open which is going to yeah you said there was a lot of things with like water water and stuff yeah What's, how talk a little bit about what that is because like here in the pacific northwest water and and all of that is easy i mean it it, it rains it's still it a danger we have had nestle tried to come into the columbia right. gorge and and steal our water yeah i'm um, still like they're not they're not going to pay level. their right but, but it's still a, i'm trying to acknowledge that it is still yeah. a danger for those listeners that will be sending us mail about that particular point, yes, we are aware. Thank you for also being aware, listeners. And yet really for you in the desert, desert, that's huge. Yes, it's definitely a big, you know, we are in a drought and it hasn't, mm-hmm. you know, we have to be conscious of what we're using. And there has been the threat. I mean, I call it a threat, but folks are, companies are wanting to come in and build like 250 homes, gated community in Joshua Tree. It's just oh. like, how is there going to be enough water? Yeah. You know, and because Joshua Tree has become so trendy, um, it, so many people are wanting to buy vacation homes for the purposes of Airbnb. Um, okay. It's it's awful. It's really yeah. changed. So when you have a brewery wanting to grow, go in, the county does is like they're cautious of this because of the whole water rights. And Patrick, we were talking about that earlier. You know more about it. Yeah. Um well, the, the beer making is in a professional level is, I mean, it's, it's like a 10 to one ratio, 10 gallons of water goes into making one finished beer. Mm-hmm. One so finished a, gallon of yeah, beer. Right. Okay. Yeah, partly it's the water and stuff that's going into the beer and the sparge. And, and the all sanitization that. Mm-hmm. and the cleaning of the right. equipment. I mean, it's a lot of water involved. And that doesn't yeah. even include the water that it took to grow the grain yep. sure. or to grow the herbs. This is just purely in, a, in the, the industrial point of making beer. Yeah. So what they're doing now is a lot of like OSU here is teaching water reclamation and how do you environmentally balance beer making, especially in areas that are having water issues. Um, there's breweries in Texas, Arizona, Southern California that are dealing with this. And it's a major, major issue because technically they probably can't continue to do what they're doing uh, and be profitable. Yeah. Because yeah. it's going to start to cost them a lot of money. And, you know, beer is is not cheap, you know, and a really good beer gets to be really expensive. And mm-hmm. when you're looking at $10 for a 20 ounce beer, some people will just say, I'm not going to pay that. Right. So It better yeah. be really awesome. So they're working yeah. at how can they use gray water to sanitize and um, for all of the non, you know, consumable water and just have it, you know, so the boiling water and that and the stuff that goes into the stuff that we would consume is going to be normal. So that's what they're working with right now, but it, it's difficult and it's, it's a mindset because now you're not just, are you investing in all of the equipment for professional or, um, microbreweries? There's a lot of gear. There's oh, a yeah. lot of stainless steel that gets yeah. bought. Yep. And a lot of big boilers and cookers. It's a huge investment. And now mm-hmm. you're looking at an investment of water reclamation. Definitely. So now it's a whole other system that you might have to purchase yeah. in order to continue to brew um, in the area that you might be in. So we've been having issues with that because we were supposed to be open. Like, well, they were, it's not me. It's just, mm-hmm. I'm collaborating Dang. on the beer project. It's, I have no involvement. I don't own the, you know, right. the brewery. But um, 
they were supposed, everybody is just waiting. We're, we're just anxious for a, like a place that we can go to because there's yeah. certain, there's not much to go to in Joshua Tree. You know, we have the saloon, which is great, but um, we would love community. to have something different, you know? Yeah, mm-hmm. you guys have a really small community. It's a small community that so like, is. How many people, what's your population? Oh, I don't roughly? know. Like, <laughs> no. like it's, it's more than four, yeah. less than four million. More than 80. More than 80 people. <laughs> <laughs> so Eugene would be a big city compared to Joshua. Um, you know, I just, I just am very, uh, we've only, I've only explored Eugene just for a moment, but it's big. It's big. Oh, it's yeah. definitely big. So it's we're, we're big. at about 150 million students. No, we're session. not. I mean, I would thousand, say maybe 5,000. Yeah. I don't know. So it's a really small so town. It's a small yeah. We're small, but we it live, just yeah. seems so big because we have all these tourists. Oh, yeah. right. that are coming in and it's it's great but um well, it brings a lot of business economics to the area but and it also brings problems it brings problems oh yeah it's changed a lot i airbnb is not my thing but um sounds like brewery, you're running for local public office according <laughs> to wiki it says that there are 7,414 hey you people. were okay. pretty close i was close yeah. i was yeah. close yeah, yeah. just drink to that oh. sure. cheers yeah, cheers <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so that's that's pretty small yeah and i know what you mean by the the rotating population making it seem we have that in eugene because we have several colleges so in the yeah. summer you see tumbleweed going through the streets and where'd all the people go and yeah. they're working to get more festivals to get more people in there for some reason i don't know why that's an issue but i guess it's business yeah we business we definitely it see it because there's a lot of festivals that happen in, in the high desert, mm-hmm. you know, and like Which I is said, a problem. It's, oh, it's yeah. such a big problem. Such an, and talk about that, please. Okay. Well, there is this, I won't say what festival, but I kind of got into it with uh, <laughs> the guy that runs their social media, which I was told is the guy that is kind of behind that festival. But um, there was a festival that brought in a ton of folks, um, last year for the last two years uh, that they were in the high desert and a lot of these people are from los angeles they're from the cities and they're coming into a desert and they don't understand how to be conscious of our environment system and it's a delicate ecosystem Mm -hmm. they don't understand so there was a lot of um trash there was a lot of partying they left a lot of their their junk behind people were hanging on joshua trees they were hanging hammocks which is super bad but see these people look at because it says tree, they think it's, they a, think it's a tree. They mm-hmm. think it's a tree. It'll just regrow. It's not. And they don't understand. Yeah. Or they would climb. Well, I want to expand on that. They don't understand that, that the Joshua trees have a really shallow root system. Right. So here they have to like thrive through high winds, um, the the beating hot summers, the sun, yeah. then also the freezing. Because it snows in the desert. I mean, right. people don't. It yeah. doesn't snow in the low desert. But where I'm at, we do get snow. Um and it's freaking freezing. And then we've got the winds yeah. that could be 70 miles an hour with gusts at times. So right. we have all of these natural um, things that happen in our environment. Then you get people that don't understand that don't walk on, on, um, don't walk on the, or don't stand on Joshua trees. Don't hang your hammocks on Joshua trees. Don't right. climb them. And so I'm a part of a group that's called the Joshua Tree Guardians and it's through Facebook. And so there's different people that are trollers and they just scan hashtags and then they will put the like, put the link for the person's social media onto this group page. And then we have this uh, kind of copy and paste that we all write our own to personalize it, but asking people to please take down that photo because mm-hmm. it's, it encourages it's people encouraging. to do it again. Yeah. And people don't, a lot of people do not understand. They that. don't like, get it. They right. throw, I'm sure they did this to you because they've done this test in clinic. Well, freedom of speech, mm-hmm. like that's oh, not yeah, the way the it works. No, yeah. and that they don't get it. That is not the way it works. So really these people that have that attitude, right? there was this one, I can say whatever her. I want. <laughs> well, that's a two-year-old behavior and I understand it's fun to be a two-year-old, but now you're an adult. So now you're supposed to be a good representation of what it means to be an adult in this community. So your behavior now, specifically since they're showing that behavior very publicly, needs to be exemplary otherwise some somebody dumber than you will do what you just mm-hmm. did again and then that just shows it's not there's never just one no it there's happens a never lot never just one and this is a domino effect that we've noticed with the joshua trees yeah and it really is 
very, people are so passionate about it. You know, we've had musicians, one famous one that will probably never, ever, ever play at Pappy and Harriet's or ever come back mm-hmm. to the high desert because she is now like, nobody likes her, but she made a music video and spray painted a Choya and oh. spray painted a Joshua tree because That's the producer so- and the director said it was dead. That's inappropriate. You know, and this is a kind Even of thing. Even if it's and, dead, you shouldn't be spray painting. You Why would be you graffito tag? That's exactly. Wrong. That's just wrong. So we have people that do this kind of things, you know, or they build fire rings and they're building um, fires in areas that they're not supposed to. Mm-hmm. So we, it's like we're dry. We, you know, and you're hiking in some place and you're making a fire. There's not room to do anything. You know, you, you're going to. Yeah. We can't. It, it's hard to. We're, we can't get a fire engine into the middle of the desert. We're, right. It's going to be a lot yeah. of money and it, it, if you're right. doing something illegal like this. So we have a lot of people that are just, it's so beautiful and they want to come out and take their cute little photos. And this is what that music festival is bringing in. And the guy didn't like understand, but there's documentation of like the time frames. In fact, I had communication with one gal who was a musician that was uh, hanging hammocks, drinking beer, and then all her other photos were of the festival that she had been at just a few mm. days prior. So we're seeing how this is affecting, um, they're coming into the desert, they're coming in with no knowledge of how to like act and behave right. in a different environment. And it's like the Wild West or Disneyland to these kids. Yeah. And yeah, so, it's something that you really need to work on educating. Yeah, I mean, education is key. Education is definitely key. So I, I really focus on that. And um, especially with wild crafting, I'm asked a lot mm-hmm. But even by herbalist yeah. uh, to take them while crafting. And, you know, we all know that we have our stands that we love and we've mm-hmm. grown to know and we don't do that. Right. But I have a lot of people that want me to take them while crafting and, and they don't even know how to act or be in the desert. So I right. don't do that. I want to make that clear. I, I don't ever, I mean, even that I don't want to do. Right. I'm very protective of the desert. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. That's good. So, yeah. um, so what other desert herbs are you guys thinking about possibly putting into beers? Well, Chaparral gonna make it. Oh, you! Oh. <laughs> I love that. That is like my favorite desert scent. So the I actually talked to the guy, well, one of the guys, about this. Um, I would love to do creosote bush. Mm-hmm. The problem with that is um, the resin. I was thinking if we did that at the end for the aroma. Yeah, that's what mm-hmm. I'm thinking. Because if we could have heavy. a beer that smells like, like the desert smell. rain, yes. that would be amazing. That would so, be like spring desert. Beers. Spring desert mm-hmm. beer, and. Yeah. I, I I don't know. Like I'm I'm still exploring with different plants. I was thinking about juniper was Ooh, one. Sure, you know I love yeah. juniper, but there's already um, a brewery out in Mammoth that has a beer that I love called 395, mm-hmm. and it's juniper and white sage. So I don't uh, want to like copy them. Copy. Right. Yeah. 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 So I mean, it could be juniper and yerba santa. Could you yeah. smell with like a nopal fruit? Ooh. Hmm. Or is that a problem? Actually, no. We too? one of the guys did talk about that, and I don't know how to go about doing that. Mm-hmm. So that would be it would be something question. because the seed they're starting to fruit now. Right. Some of them are starting to fruit. That would probably be a secondary. Like I think I'd probably use that at like a dry hop. As a dry use hop, it, yeah, I'd use hmm. it that way. Obviously not hops, but so you brew your beer, and at the end you add the hop, the fruit. After it's like the ferment, either while it's fermenting or after the fermentation, you give it a second. For like the taste. Mm -hmm. And you just put it in the bottom of the the keg and then put that in Mm. on top and let it mix. Let it do its thing for 10 days or so and then then bottle it. Well, it's, it's coming. I'm waiting actually for it because I want to make some jam yeah. with it, but um, it's coming. Yeah. There's this, yeah. this area next to my house where I got the choyas from for yeah. you. Mm-hmm. And so I keep watching them yeah. and hoping that they'll, they'll happen. But as far as other herbs, I mean, I, I'm, I'm still for desert plants. It's like, there's so many great medicinal plants in the desert, yeah. but I'm just like their taste, how would they taste? Yeah. And I don't know if it would yeah. match. So for me, I'm a big fan of pinion. I love pinion. Nice. Um, I love yerba santa, obviously, yes. and creosote bush. And I'm just worried because there's so many people from sampling, giving these samples out, and doing right. events, and and you know letting yeah. people taste this beer. We're learning that there's a lot of folks that don't. Um, some people just do not like herbs. Some people don't yeah. like herbal mm-hmm. beers. Right. So it's I'm, probably genetic damage. Yeah. So yeah. I want to yeah. like help yeah, them. The, <laughs> last, the last 400 years have not been good for right. like really creativity and beer, in my opinion. Really? Because yeah. it seems like we. I have tasted beers with all kind propolis flavored, and we've seen we some good another... stuff in the last like decade. Uh-huh. But the last 400 years haven't been great because hops became the 
first the only one you were allowed to use and then the dominant one for a very mm -hmm. long time afterwards. Mm -hmm. And it was all like a profit system. That's why that happened. Mm -hmm. So before the hops became the one that, that, you know, everybody had to use, there was a wide selection of what people did. I mean, mm -hmm. people, people were used to the idea that beer doesn't necessarily mean it tastes like hops, that it, it tastes like a whole, there's like a whole variety. Sure. It's yeah. amazing. Microbrewer has done good for that. Yeah. yeah. And so the last, we've seen over the last couple of decades, we're seeing more and more improvement in terms of people starting to open their tastes up, which I'm, I mean, I, that's exciting for me. Mm -hmm. And there are people are doing that in many different avenues to mm -hmm. beer and in grocery stores, you're seeing much more variety on grocery store shelves. Yes. People are being awareness of the different, the bioregionalism for herbal medicine. Yeah. People are just, I think they're hungry for it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it definitely is going to be something that catches people's eyes. You know, I, I definitely want to focus on that. It's the, for folks out there that think I'm wild crafting the white sage, I'm not. Yeah. Um, this is white sage from my friend's garden. Um, she has this uh, shop called Cactus Mart, and she's got this yeah. beautiful garden, and she lets me gather from her garden. Um, so, yeah, the white sage is definitely not. It's it's actually gathered from somebody's place. Which but the good. other – and then, you know, the other plants I do while craft. Uh, but – And what do you guys have for liver – like liver herbs, like we use dandelion. You have a, a desert dandelion. Well, we, there's Does a desert work? dandelion, but you know what? This year, um, we it's it didn't. Species. It did not. It's not. Yeah, it's not. Last year, my well, it was even crazy. Like our there was so much invasive mustard that was a big problem for us, and this mm. year we didn't even have that issue. Oh, of course. And which is good for us because yeah, that's it, good. For some reason, it brings in this bug that I notice Ooh. is we had to get the house sprayed. Um, so because this mustard is not growing as it was right. last year. Uh, we're noticing not a big um, incline with these certain bugs. We Good. see it, just a few of them, whereas mm -hmm. last year it was Good. like a flood of them. So desert dandelion didn't grow very much this year okay. um, because it was Drought. really dry. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it was it, it, last year was just beautiful. Do was, you have something else that you potentially use? Well, for, there's yeah. the milk thistle that we have out there. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I that don't, probably isn't going to have. Like yeah, desert dandelion has a really good flavor for bittering. And it's so it's, I'm thinking about what would be the good liver herbs because that's one of the things I like putting in my beer because you know alcohol is processed in the liver. So why not help your liver out a little? I haven't thought about <laughs> you know, I so. haven't thought about that in, in that way with making the beer because I I when they asked me about making a beer, one yeah. thing they said was that they don't want it to be it needs to be flavored well, flavored it's all well, about the flavor, um, but yeah. more like. They don't want it to be like a medicine beer. Right, right. So yeah. I, I was focusing on like, what smells amazing and what. And then yes. another thing you asked was, um, have I thought about any other herbs, would be desert willow. Ooh. The flowers Ooh. smell amazing. Really so I thought, could I do this for the last, for the aroma? Yeah. So this is something that she's not, well, she just started to, she's in, she's growing now. She's not in flower yet. She being yeah. the desert willow. Desert willow, yeah. Desert and I have one next door, and I'm noticing how she's just starting to, her leaves are starting to come back. But um, the flowers, if that's something that I would like to experiment with, uh, mm. is, is testing the flowers out to see if I could smell wow. for the aroma. Okay. Wow, that sounds incredible. I'm really looking forward to the yeah. projects that Thank are you. coming yeah. out of your creative mind and all of yes. your expertise. We're going to have to find a reason to get you back out here with more beers. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, we'll see what beer what's our next project but it's definitely going to change i want to focus yeah. on a few mm -hmm. herbal beers that are not just this kind mm -hmm. well so christina Chan sanchez thank you for being with us and how do people get a hold of you um i'm everyleafspeaks.com is my website um instagram is everyleafspeaks and so is uh facebook and there's links on my website as to how they can get a hold of me and yeah and the brewery is Joshua Tree Brewery Company, and they plan on being open depending upon what the county, how that works out. We're looking at October. Sweet. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers. 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 And, oh, and remember. And always, put, put an, an herb, herb on it. it. <laughs> the statements made about herbs and products on this podcast have not been evaluated by the United States Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. All information provided on this podcast 
or any affiliated websites is for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for advice from your physician or other healthcare professional. You should not use the information on this podcast and its affiliated websites for a diagnosis or treatment of any health problem. Always consult with healthcare professional before starting any new vitamins, supplements, diet, or exercise program before taking any medication or if you have or suspect you might have a health problem. Any testimonials, questions, or case studies are based on individual results and do not constitute a guarantee that you will achieve the same results.